Good morning. My name's Amy. I'm the certified diabetes educator here at Mercy Hospital Jefferson. Um, and today, Lisa has invited me to come talk about behavioral health and inpatient glycemic control. Um, so we're going to go through several things, including case scenarios. And so we want your guys' um, input. We're going to talk a lot, and I want you to speak loud so that we can hear you. Um, but also, we want you to have that solid understanding. And I feel that if you are communicating with, then your understanding is a little more clear. So why behavioral health and inpatient glycemic control? Diabetes and psychiatric disorders share a bi-directional association, both influencing one another. I kind of put it like, is it the chicken and the egg scenario, which came first? We don't always know. Um, the diabetes can develop, which leads to psychiatric disorder, particularly depression. If they have a history of schizophrenia or depression, it can lead to diabetes or hyperglycemia. Some of the medications that they might take, Cyprexa, Haldol, Klonopin, um, any of those types of medications increase your patient's insulin resistance, leading to hyperglycemia. Um, so emotional well-being is very pivotal to achieving effective diabetes self-management. If your blood sugars are all over the board, severe highs, severe lows, you're gonna feel like you're on a roller coaster. In this scenario, they're whitewater rafting. That's definitely not for me. It makes me feel kind of crazy. I've been a couple of times. Um, but what we want to achieve is a nice, smooth sailing, relaxing canoe ride, so to speak. Those glycemic excursions lead to the patient not feeling well. High blood sugar makes you feel tired weak low blood sugar makes you feel tired not having the energy to get up and do what you need to do so inpatient hyperglycemia and this is all across the board it's not just behavioral health it increases your length of stay for your patients increases their financial burden people with diabetes particularly high blood sugars or severe low have at least twice the medical cost of any other patient outside the hospital so it's just very expensive. Increase in mortality and morbidity. Um, inpatient hyperglycemia gives us the opportunity to diagnose diabetes. Anytime in our facility we have a serum glucose that's over 180, if they've not had an A1C done during their stay, the lab will automatically run that test, looking for diabetes. Um, so it's a protocol that can be ordered if they have a history of diabetes and the physician or the nurse practitioner has not ordered that A1C and it has not been done in the last three months, it's 84 days, then you as a nurse have a protocol that you can order it. Um, the lab will not run it if it's been done in the last three months. So they do go back and check and see, but you guys can do that as uh, nurses. <clears throat> Identify those at risk for issues or concerns, severe excursions, low blood sugar, high blood sugar. You know, somebody with type one diabetes can have a 50 and a 500 in the same 24 hours. Um, financial burden, we wanna make sure they can afford all their medications before they leave the hospital. Um, and then I put depression on here because we really are talking a lot about behavioral health. But people with diabetes have two to four times the risk of depression than anybody else. Um, with other medical conditions. And then to optimize their regimen for outside the hospital. So if they're running high, we wanna make sure, are they taking their medicines? Are they following their meal plan? Um, how can we help them be more successful? So our goals for inpatient diabetes management are the same, whether it's behavioral health, med surge, ICU, it's just to be safe and effective. Um, we wanna avoid the lows. The, hypoglycemia, we want to avoid any severe hyperglycemia. Now, we do understand that hyperglycemia can result from illness, from stress, from changes in their medicine regimen. And with that being said, we know that they could be a little higher than normal. So our target range is 70 to 180. Outside the hospital, their target range is less than 140. But we give that little bit of leeway knowing that illness, stress, infection it's gonna make them a little higher than usual. 
So effective, again, blood sugar goal, 70 to 180. That's our inpatient plan. Um, and then maybe just improve from their pre-admission state. If they're admitted A1C 12, for example, their average sugar is 300. If we get them consistently under 200, that's an improvement. Most of our hospitalists will agree to discharge anywhere between 2 and 250 if we know that they have long-term hyperglycemia. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the A1C. This is basically the gold standard for monitoring diabetes control. It is the percentage of sugar attached to the hemoglobin blood cells. It reflects an average sugar over the last three months. We know that our red blood cells last 90 to 120 days, so we want to capture what their A1C or those sugars attached to those blood cells that are alive and healthy and functioning. Um, the estimated average glucose is a calculation that we do that shows what your meter would show your patient at home. So if we do the A1C and I say 12, in my mind I know that's about an average blood sugar of 300. The way I know how to do that is you can pull out the calculator and you can do this big long calculation or you can do the easy peasy version of that I have listed here. If you take your A1C, whatever number it is, including the decimals, subtract the number two, very simple math, and then multiply that number by 30. It's, you can do it fast, quick at the bedside. If I said your A1C is nine, nine minus two is seven, seven times 30 is 210, right? So their average sugar on their meter is gonna be about 210. So you guys can do that and then have conversations with the patient. Um, so can you guys tell me if we had an A1C of 10.5, what would mean that estimated average glucose on your patient? Ten point five, close, more like two sixty, two sixty two seventy. So you'll, I would take ten point five and A one C of ten is two forty, and you can add a little bit. And the reason we say kind of average, your blood sugar, like I said, type one can vary dramatically all throughout the day. Type two is your blood sugar is like your blood pressure; it goes up and down and up and down. So if we say your average is two hundred to ten they're gonna kind of shake their head like yes. Uh, but it's good to know, we're gonna go over a scenario in a little while, what your A1C is and compare it to the blood sugars that you're seeing here in the hospital. Um, do you know where to find your A1C levels in Epic? Results, that's exactly right, results review. You do have to go down under diabetes, it'll say endocrine and then diabetes. If you don't see the A1C listed, or it actually says diabetes, on the bottom left-hand side in EPIC on your results review, if you click expand, it gives you anything that they've ever had in the date. So just because they were here two weeks ago and we did an A1C, you might not see it on this new admission. Doesn't mean they need another one, it means that you need to go look for it first. Um. All right, so hyperglycemia signs and symptoms. They could be weak, shaky, want to throw up, dizzy, blurred vision, might have some cramps, have a headache. Signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can actually be very, very similar. The only way to know is to test that blood sugar and see where that patient is. Um, chronic complications, kidney disease, eye disease, heart disease, two to four times increased risk for a stroke or a heart attack if you just have that diagnosis of diabetes. Um, retinopathy, numbness and tingling, the neuropathy um, that can develop. So we want to prevent those. If, when we're done, I do have a little um, example of a card that you can look through and see what the patients might actually see with different types of damage to their eye. Um, so it's kind of interesting when they say their vision is blurry because their sugars are high. You can look in here and see it also shows the dark spots, maybe if they had a retinal bleed or um, something to that effect. All right, so we do wanna be able to use the hyperglycemia order set while they're here in the hospital. I've talked to both of the nurse practitioners um, and they're really good at using the order set when they're here if they have a history of diabetes. 
The order set is great because it has insulin orders, hypoglycemia rescue, when to call the physician, when to test the blood sugar, any labs, consults, diet, nursing communications. And then once the order set, once the orders have been placed and the order set is activated, you'll have education and care planning automatically added into Epic. So you don't have to go ahead and add a care plan, it will be done for you, you just have to activate the order set. Uh, so we do wanna use that as much as possible. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to insulins. Um, and it's very important to know the different types of insulin that you are giving to your patient and how it functions, when it starts to work, and how long it lasts. So Lantus and Levomir are basal insulins. They start to work. They deliver a long, slow trickle of insulin over 20 to 24 hours. Um, the onset is not for two hours. So when we have a patient whose blood sugar might be, say, 89, and we're a little leery of wanting to give that insulin, if you're giving Lantus or Levomir, Lantus is underlined because it's hospital preferred formulary, but we can certainly use Levomir also. Um, we just have to know that Lantus isn't even going to begin to work for at least two hours. Um, so in your mind, you have to think their blood sugar could be rising over that next two hours. And so if I don't give it now, they could be significantly higher. Um, it has little to no peak. And like I said, it lasts from 20 to 24 hours. Um, occasionally, we will use NPH insulin. MPH usually is prescribed for patients who have financial difficulty on most of the time. Um, it's given twice a day, so it does only last for 10 to 12 hours. You want to make sure that it's at least those 10 to 12 hours apart to prevent any overla overlapping or stacking of the insulin. Um, it does begin to work a little bit sooner than the Lantus, about one to two hours. It does have a peak, so it's very important to appreciate that peak. Once it starts to work, it is gonna have a little hump in the middle, usually somewhere between noon and two. So we wanna make sure that they're having lunch. They're not skipping any of those meals. Um, and it does last eight to 10 to 12 hours. One thing that's good with our order sets is that the administration instructions does tell you that it is a basal or a long acting insulin and that it should not be held without notifying the physician even if your patient is MPO. So we wanna give it. If you think about basal insulin, your pancreas is the organ that really isn't doing a great job. That's why you need to have insulin replacement. Your liver and your kidneys both have a little bit of uh, sugar production and release. So they're still making sugar and releasing sugar into the system, but the pancreas can't keep up. The, just because your pancreas isn't working right doesn't mean your kidney and your liver aren't. So that's why we have to make sure we give that basal insulin every day, no matter what, we don't miss. It's certainly understandable if you're really nervous about the dose or concerned that it's significantly too high, um, just call the physician and ask them. I work very closely with the hospitalist group, the nurse practitioners here, and when we have doses that just don't seem to make sense for the patient, maybe it's too much based on their weight, which is typically how Lantus is dosed, then I'll always encourage them to at least let's start with half. We don't want to cause harm by making them have a low blood sugar. Can we start with giving the half dose that they say they normally would take? They will almost always agree. Sometimes they don't. That's their prerogative. They're still the provider. Um, but we don't want to say, can I not give it because they're low or at risk for low? Can we start with 50%? Very rarely do they say no. Um, the risk, if you do not give basal insulin, is that they could, especially with somebody that has type 1 diabetes, their, if their blood sugars can rise about 50 to 100 points an hour without insulin in their system. So just because they're 70 now, we don't give the basal insulin, for example, they'll be four or 500 by morning within 12 hours. So we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing by the patient. Um, but always have that communication with your providers. I talked with Susan yesterday. Um, I think she's pretty open to communication and wanting to, if you have a concern or a question, she said, tell them they need to call. We'd rather you call than not. So bolus or prandial insulin. Prandial means meal time. 
So that's going to be the set dose given to treat the food intake of the patient. It's given in response to the increase in glucose from food or carbohydrates given. It's always given with the meal. So prandial in our facility is usually a set dose three times a day before they eat. We're not talking the correction or the sliding scale. This is specifically designed for when they eat. Um, it is always given within 30 minutes. We saw before that prandial insulin starts to work right away, five to 15 minutes, so you don't want any significant delay in the time that you give the dose and their meal comes. Uh, the dose is adjusted if we use the order set. If their blood sugar is less than 90 and the nurse practitioner usually has used the order set, you have, as a nurse, the ability to decrease that dose by 50%. But the rectangle on the bottom shows us that that is in the order, whereas with the Lantus, it's a question for the physician. It's not built in the order. Does that make sense? So this is your nurse community, or your MAR instructions on the bottom. It specifically says in there, if the blood glucose is 70 to 89, you can reduce that dose by 50. On the basal, it's a recommendation that if we're concerned about the dose, you may decrease it by 50 only after getting an order from the doctor or the nurse practitioner. Um, on, the on the stop sign here, those are little sticky notes that we use currently. Our process is going to change within the next several months. Um, that just tells your patient you are on medication that needs to be given with food, please tell your nurse. So that on the regular floor, they'll be able to call their nurse, tell them my food has been delivered or I've ordered my meal so we can get their blood sugar and their insulin as close to that meal as possible. You guys, and Terry and I were talking earlier, you really have a privilege that your meals are delivered at a certain time. The nurses on the floor would probably give up their firstborn child to have their meals delivered at the same time every day. Because you could have A bed eating at 6.30 in the morning, B bed eating at 9.30, and you have to go in that room different times to test their blood sugar and to give their injection. Whereas you guys really have kind of a set plan. Now, sure it's a struggle. Um, we just have to get practicing and working on getting it as close to that meal as possible. Okay. Yes, Terry. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that if her blood sugar is 70 to 89, I can take that to six units, I mean to three units instead of six units? Is that so, yes. Yeah. So your question is, if you have a patient that's on a set meal time dose of six, units. three times a day, plus her, scale. plus her correction scale, yeah. right. So if it's ordered with the order set, so that's the caveat to that. The nurse practitioner, whoever put in that order, if they use the order set, then you will have that communication or that MAR instruction that says, if their blood sugar is between 70 and 89, you decrease the dose by 50% and increase to the next highest whole number. So if they don't select that part, then Yes. So it will not automatically pop up. Your question was, do they have to make that decision? And the answer is yes. Okay. So a different on the other side of that, Terry, is that if your patient just has that six, three times a day, the provider did not use the order set, and they didn't add any instructions in there, and your blood sugar is 73, if they're going to eat, you still give the six. You have to right. give the whole dose. Yeah. So, but you do have the ability with the order set. So I just kind of want to differentiate the two. Yep. But they have to select that. It's not the nurse that makes that. That's the doctor no. that's Right. If it's not in your MAR instructions on the bottom, then you give it as it's ordered. Yep. Good question. All right. So bolus, insulin, or correction. We try to use correction here. It's the old time sliding scale. Um, if you ever met a diabetes educator, they don't use the word sliding scale anymore. We try to use correction insulin. Um, 
And the easiest way to explain that is we're correcting the hyperglycemia. So if you think about it, sliding scale, what does that mean? Doesn't really say much, does it? It's all over the board. Um, and it's a very reactionary approach. So if we have a patient whose blood sugars are high, we give them long acting, we give them a meal time, and then if they go higher, we correct the high. That's what the correction insulin is for. Um, given to treat the elevated glucose from illness, stress, infection, medications. Um, it's always given with a meal or in, when MPO. Just because, so the perennial insulin, if they're not gonna eat for a test or a procedure, we don't give that six, for example, in your scenario. But if their blood sugar was 185, we would need to give them three because we're correcting the high to bring their blood sugar back into target range. Um, add it to the perennial dose if they have both ordered. So if they had a six ordered and they were gonna eat, blood sugar was 185, you would add those two together and that is three. So total of eight. Should always be the same kind of insulin. Um, occasionally we have patients who use a regular insulin for their fast acting at home. We don't wanna have a fast acting regular for meal plus a no vlog sliding scale or correction dose because now you're gonna to have to give them two injections. It should always be the same kind of insulin. Uh, and always give and make sure, even if they're MPO for a test or a procedure or anything, the correction insulin they still should have. So point of care glucose testing, um, it is, should always be a CNHS. If they are eating on bolus tube feedings, it should be timed with the tube feeding itself. If they're on continuous tube feedings, it should be about every six hours. Should always be within that 30 minute time frame of the meal, as absolutely close to that as possible you can get. When we change our process with the um, the little sticky notes that we are currently using, we'll probably start auditing to see how effective we can be in getting it in that time frame. Um, if Q4 hours, if they are NPO, tube feeding, TPN, or steroids, you guys probably won't have TPN, but you could have steroids. And I've heard you've had tube feedings, which is awesome, because not something you used to do in the past, or at least not very often. And so their frequency of testing, because tube feedings can often cause their blood sugars to go higher, then it should be at least every four hours, no longer than every six. And we want it, if it's a continuous tube feeding, we want it on a schedule like a Q4. If the tube feeding is bolus, then it really has to be done on that bolus time frame, not on a schedule. It has to match the carbohydrate intake. Um, it, this may not really affect you, but pre or post surgery or procedure, if they have to leave the floor to go for a significant test or procedure, you should test their blood sugar, especially if they're taking insulin. Um, signs and symptoms of high or low. So when I do RNO, I try to get the nurses to understand that it's okay to test the blood sugar. Just because a physician hasn't ordered it, if they don't feel right, if they have a history of diabetes, if they're on medications that could increase their blood sugar if um, we haven't gotten orders yet from the doctor to test and they have signs of a low blood sugar, it's better to test than not. And you guys as nurses can do that. Anytime you test the blood sugar outside of the time frame that it's scheduled, the Epic automatically creates an order for you so you don't even have to go in and put an order in for it. Just test it. We'd rather you test to be safe and prevent long-term complications or short-term complications than to have a major problem. And our question is why wasn't you tested? It's certainly a nursing uh, call on that one. Question? question. So when you have continuous tube feeding, it's easier to get the insulin um, scheduled and then correction insulin. But when you do the bolus tube feeding, check the blood sugar before the bolus of tube feeding and treat that blood sugar before the tube feeding or do you check the blood sugar after the bolus? So the question is if you have continuous tube feeding should you test the blood sugar it's on a schedule it will be Q4 or Q6 
if you have a bolus tube feeding, the point of care sugar is tested before the bolus, insulin is given, it's like they're eating, that's their food intake. So test the blood sugar before, give their insulin injection, and give the bolus. That still should be within that same 30 minute time frame. So did that clarify? Yep. Okay, Megan. So you're asking if um, the HS check of the point of care sugar should be four hours after supper. So we know that our insulin and our meal should be within that 30 minute time frame. And so it should be at least four hours after the insulin. So the food, because it's, you're gonna be, you're only gonna be at part 30 minutes. Uh, but the reason that you should not test it for at least four hours as if you gave insulin for the meal, the insulin's still working in short of three and a half, you know, to four hours. So if I have, and we find this on the medical, the regular medical floors, they'll do, they'll have supper at 6.30, the aides will come around and test the blood sugar at 8.30, it's two hours, the insulin is still fully effective in their system, so you're really not gonna have a good accurate reading. You need to wait that four full hours for that right. insulin to have been worn off. Right. What time's dinner? Okay. So just working, so yeah, I understand where you're coming from. The question, I guess the concern is that if Dinner's at 5.30, your snack is at 8.30. That's not gonna be your full, it's gonna be about three hours or so. Or less. So, or less. Hmm. Right, that might be something we have to work on that timing. Do you think, Jackie? So maybe we can kind of tweak that timing so that it is a little closer to that four full hours and just helping them understand that getting insulin before their snack or their meal is as important as having the snack. Um, but I see where you're coming from because a lot of times that's very, snack time is very social yeah, and... I mean, there's a lot of them that are fine with waiting. Right. But for the ones that are, I mean, do we just charge that they were educated and what you wait Right, if they can't really wait that full four hours, then I would just document that you have educated them um, and the importance of helping their blood sugar be as controlled as possible. You know, a lot of times I'll explain to the patient, the better control you have on your sugar, the faster you get to go home. Um, so if we can, I mean, that kind of sounds manipulative, but typically it's true. And that if we can control your blood sugars the best while you are here, then when you go home, you get to go home faster, and then you'll know the right process. That doesn't really work on behavioral health. Right. Not their blood sugars. That they will keep them back. So, but really, patients don't want to care. But the night shift, they don't give that much fast back to HS, though. Do you think it's rare? It's not on everybody. So, night shift. So a lot of times you're right, they don't give fast acting insulin at bedtime. It has to be ordered as a separate order. But if they have it ordered and we have to test the blood sugar at least four hours after their meal, you know, the patients still have rights and we have to go and respect those rights. Maybe just make sure they're fully aware of why it's important. And if they still insist on snacks and it's time for their insulin, they get it. Um, so you're just trying to protect them. If you also give the insulin, you know, you go back in and you test the sugar and you give additional insulin, you're increasing their risk for a low because of the stacking of the insulin. Um, so you should not have that many, I think Terry's right, with fast acting insulin at bedtime. It's rare. And usually if they have that order, I've seen that the doctor will also have an order to check them like at two in the morning or something. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. So you're just if you do have fast acting insulin and they often will have that 2 a.m. just to look and see if their blood sugar happens to decrease from those extra doses at bedtime. Okay, good discussion. Uh, so point of care testing and hyperglycemia. Point of care testing glucose should, uh, if it is over 250, these are from our order set. So again, the provider should have used the order set. If it's two, more than 250 for two consecutive readings, we need to let them know, notify the provider. Any single glucose more than 300, again, we notify the doctor, whether it be at two o'clock in the morning or at nine o'clock in the morning, more than 300 once is a call to the physician. Um, point of care glucose more than 400, so we're going to reject the initial result on the meter because that's a critical level then we repeat that test. If you can get more blood out of that same sample site, go for it. If you cannot, you have to stick them again. Um, if the POC glucose is over 400 again, then you order a stat serum. So you guys had the question earlier, does the nurse practitioner or the provider have the right to override that? And they do. They are the medical provider. This is just going to help us begin to look for a patient that is at risk for DKA. A couple of years ago, we had a couple of patients that were on behavioral health that actually ended up having to go to the unit for DKA. We weren't as maybe proactive as we could have been about taking care of that blood sugar when it was high. So that's where that protocol comes from. So, and this is housewide. Any point of care sugar more than 400, repeat it, still more than 400, get a stat serum glucose. Um, if the lab calls you because that glucose is over 400, they are then going to run the ketone test to look for DKA. Uh, there is a smart phrase in EPIC that you can enter. It's under Jeff Jefferson um, ketones. If you go in there and type in ketones, you'll get that smart phrase. Um, if the lab calls you to say the ketones are positive, that is another call to the provider because they could be headed into DKA. If it's small, sometimes they'll stay on your unit. If it's large or high, then they may need to be transferred off. So it's just that constant communication with your nurse practitioners, your medical providers. So this is the glucose accordion. This is one of my favorite screens on the whole EPIC system. It tells you just about anything and everything you want to know, with the exception of PTA medications about your patient that has high blood sugars. So for example, this patient um, it tells me when they were admitted that circle, their A1C is 6.4. If we do that math, 6.4, what does that tell me their average estimated glucose is? Get close. 120 ish. Ish is good because it's not going to necessarily be that exact number that I'm looking for. Um, so our A1C is 6.4. It also has your anion gap, some CO2 levels, creatinine to help us look for diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and you see above their serum glucose is 282. So if we did our math, we know that their average at home is 120-ish and 282. That should kind of pique some interest. Those don't match up. What's going on with the patient? Are they under stress? Did they you know, go to the bread company before they got here, eat too much, skip their insulin? What's going on? It doesn't match or make sense. Um, it also puts on there your glue uh, percentage of diet eaten. It will turn red if it's 50% or less. So we wanna pay attention to how much your patients are eating. A scenario we have in a few minutes, the patient had a blood sugar of 23 because he refused to eat. Um, and it's very clearly documented, we could see how that hypoglycemia event occurred. So. If you don't know how to find the glucose accordion, I will teach Lisa and she would love to show you. It's easy to find in EPIC. Once you add it to your reports tab, you can find it on each and every patient. You don't have to hunt it down anymore. Um, and then the last arrow shows you any insulin dose that was given. And then we know if we hover to discover, we learn more information. It will also give you the time. This five has little extra lines, so there's a comment in there, something that happened to the patient. 
All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie. Jackie is the clinical dietary supervisor for Mercy. She's just been with us for a few months and she's gonna go over just a few minutes of the challenges with behavioral health and snacks and the new plan that we have in place. So. Okay. Hi, I'm Jackie Valk. I'm the clinical dietitian supervisor. I'm also a certified diabetes educator. So I was gonna go over some of the snack choices that um, we decided to kind of help out with you guys. Uh, I think it was a little bit of controversy with having one diabetic snack list and then a regular snack list and people felt singled out as patients. And we don't want them to feel singled out. We want them to feel like everybody else because they are. So we went through the snack list and we wanted to make more choices for you guys to give diabetic patients that are low in carbs or no carbs. Because I think a lot of the snacks are very carby. And so um, a lot of the patients, you know, they're hungry. They have several reasons for why they're hungry, depression, um, you know, food insecurities, different issues that they come to us with. And so they want to have their snack times and we want to be able to provide that for them. So on our snack choices, I put the carb grams next to all the options. And also, I think you guys have like a little key in the back for um, like juices and things like that that also had the grams of carbs in there to kind of help give you guys an idea and a little bit of uh, security when you're giving the patient the snacks. So ideally, a diabetic would have 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal. And so this is going to grams. Right now on our menu, we look at carb choices. So that's one of the changes in a couple months. We're gonna go to grams, because when you look at a food label, it's all listed in grams. So it's gonna make a little bit more sense for our patients here and when they go home and not to confuse them. So if we're looking at a, a full meal being 45, which would be more like a female and 60 grams more for a male um, that they would have at a meal time, we are trying to shoot for a snack that's from 15 grams to about 22 grams of carbs. So on here on the left side, their first choice, um, they have that kind of range with grams of carbs, trying not to go too high. I think the highest is 24 grams of carbs for the peanut butter crackers. Um, but once they have that snack, if they're still hungry and they come back and they want something else, we have a second choice that are low or no carbs. So it would be your Jello. We're gonna stock your floors with sugar-free Jello and sugar-free pudding, but, and, and that's just gonna be the main stock. So any patient can eat that, it's okay. It's good for them all. Um, but this way they don't feel singled out like, oh, you only get this type of jello, you know, and so and so gets that type of jello. And we peel off the top of it so they really don't see it anyways. So you guys can feel very comforted by giving them the sugar free jello has no carbs in it. So if you do have a patient, maybe a scenario at nighttime that needs that blood sugar check after four hours from the meal, and we'll try to work with the timing and maybe we can figure out a better timing with you guys. But at that 845 snack time, if that patient was persistent that they wanted a snack, maybe they'll take the Jello instead and that won't affect the blood sugars then. But if they don't, it's okay, you can give them the other snack. So, but that might be a compromise like, hey, would you like the, the Jello for your snack? And then in four hours we can check that blood sugar and that won't affect that because it doesn't have any carbs in it. So maybe that makes a little bit of sense. So we're trying to choose from the second choice for their second snacks because they are lower in carbs. If they want those as their first choice, they can go for that too. Um, we do a vegetable tray with ranch. So regular ranch dressing has lower carbs than like a sugar or a light ranch or a fat-free ranch. When you take out the fat, they add sugar to it. So we'll give you guys just regular ranch and it's carrots right now. So it's about you know, they're probably getting like two grams of carbs from those carrots, barely anything. So I count that as a zero carb snack. Um, we also have the chicken noodle soup if they want. That's kind of bulky, so it looks like you're getting a little bit more. It's only got eight grams of carbs in that whole can of chicken noodle soup. Um, and then cheese sticks, they don't have any carbs and the cheese cubes don't have any carbs. But sometimes those other snacks like the cheese cubes, I feel like that looks a little bit more full than a cheese stick. So maybe they feel like they're getting a little bit more. So hopefully that can kind of satisfy the brain and, and the, the appetite a little bit without giving them too many carbs. And of course, if a patient refuses to have that second choice snack from that list and they rather have something from the first, we don't want to fight the patients. You know, you can give them that snack, but you might want to document then in Epic saying, um, patient refused the uh, low sugar snack and went with the, this snack and it has this many grams of carbs in it. That would help the nurse practitioner for when you do the next blood sugar check and you're looking at uh, it's 250 or something, maybe that's because they had you know, 40 grams of carbs at their snack time. So that can kind of help the nurse practitioner problem solve with that too because if that's a, a constant 
thing going on, they might look at the insulin and adjust it. But it just kind of gives us a little bit more information, a little more insight. Yes? So, for our patients, their snacks are more valuable to them than their meds. Um, <laughs> yeah. So they come up for their snacks, and let's say, I'm gonna, say Gertrude wants a bag of pretzels, a diabetic. Mm -hmm. She can have that bag of pretzels, but if she's not satisfied afterward, we can give her the lower part as a second three. Not, so it's kind of like giving two snacks. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Yes. Because sometimes our checks get hung up, get hung up on, well, they already have their snacks. No. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, um, the first snack, a diabetic comes up and uh, she wants like the pretzels and she gets that snack and then she comes back because she's not satisfied, she wants a little bit more of a snack and you give them that second choice that's low carbs. Then you can feel a little bit better when you give her that snack that it's not going to hurt her blood sugars, you won't affect them as bad, is giving her more carbs. So that's helping that patient out but also helping their satisfaction too. You can do that as well. The that was their whole snack. Now, and if they're still hungry. That's not going to be that much. Yeah. So if they were hungry, Well, the snacks shouldn't. Um, so the sugar free popsicle has 10 grams of carbs in it. Okay. So we went to, you guys might notice this change, but we just went to all regular popsicles. There are also 10 grams of carbs as well. Okay. So that was just an advertising ricotta. So we are just going to go to all the regular popsicles yeah, with 10 carbs. Snack with yes and no, they, they don't have to have carb snacks. You know, they could have a no carb snack and that would be perfectly yeah, fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, because their meal time, when their insulin comes up, they're having that insulin to cover the meal time. Okay. So they're not having any insulin to cover that snack. Okay. So blood sugars can tend to go up because of the snack. Because we have seen patients that didn't eat their snack and didn't come dinner time they're low. They're low. Then um, that would be a clinical issue where they maybe got too much insulin for that meal time or maybe they got a little too much correction. Uh, it would be one of those. Kind of, so the question is they have a patient that had um, didn't eat their snack and come dinner time the blood sugar went low. And then we're okay now we've got them in hypo. hypo. Yeah. So and that saying, well, eat your snack but then if they can have a snack that doesn't have heart then it's your Mm -hmm. So the nurse practitioner or the physician will look back and that glucose accordion is going to be very helpful to look at that. So why did they go low at dinner time even though they didn't have a snack? Because you shouldn't have to have a snack. So then they maybe have gave too much um, insulin at that meal time or maybe they didn't eat all of their meal. They only ate 50%. So their insulin was to cover 100% but they only ate 50% so they had a little more insulin on board so they dropped a little lower before dinner. Mm -hmm. So we need to know the snacks are relevant as an indicator for that low blood sugar. Correct. At dinner or not, it's going to be because yeah. of what they did at lunch. Mm -hmm. And snack. so the the question is like making sure that the snack should not make you have if you skip a snack, it should not create a low blood sugar for your meal time. Okay. Correct. But if you notice at lunchtime that they did only eat 50%, then trying to get them to have a carb snack would be a good idea because they didn't eat that much carbs at, at lunchtime. So they could be at that risk of going low. Okay. So just kind of use But if they eat 100%. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how. It should just cover that meal time. But yeah, if you notice that the patient's not eating very well, and of course you guys know you can always consult the dietitian and maybe we can get them a supplement or something too to help with that to prevent um, getting low blood sugars because they're not eating enough. But we'll keep an eye on that too. If you notice that they're constantly not eating a lot, then a little a carb snack would definitely help them. So, and then I also, um, juice is very high in sugar, so it's a great rescue. So if you have a hypoglycemia, your juices have about 15 grams of carbs in them, and Amy's going to talk about the, the hypos, but ideally juice by itself for a snack for a diabetic um, is going to make their blood sugar spike. So if they really are persistent that they would like a juice, maybe they can have some cheese cubes with the juice. 
because that will give them a little bit of fat and that helps slow that absorption of the carbohydrate to prevent a spike in the blood sugar. So sometimes we kind of pair a very simple sugar like that with something that has a little bit of fat. With that note, when you do a hypoglycemia event and they have a low blood sugar, you definitely only want the simple sugars because if you gave them a peanut butter crackers, it's gonna slow that rescue down and we don't wanna slow it down. So that kind of makes, makes sense. Sometimes just pairing the first and the second together will help of the snack choices. So and fruit is no longer listed on there mainly because they're very high in carbs and like bananas, a whole banana can have anywhere from 30 to 40 grams of carbs in them. And when you only get a half a banana, you know, you're kind of like, ah, oh, I only got half a banana. It's not very satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, so we want to we want to prevent that, um, and then the future for behavioral health is going to a regular patient menu, so then they can get their um, fruit with their meals then when they order. So that's our goals for this year, just to get you guys to that. So that will help, I think, satisfy a little bit more and being able to get those fruits because fruits are good for you, but they do have carbs in them, and we want to be careful with the blood sugars for snacks. So and then um, also. Sugar and sweetener, so on your floor you guys have Splendas and Sweet and Lows. Ideally the diabetics would get those uh, with their coffee or you know, if they want to put it in tea or something. That's ideal. If you think about sugar packets, some patients I know on your floor they love the sugar. Um, one packet of sugar has about six grams of carbs in them. So about three packets of sugar can have about 18 grams of carbs. So that could almost be as much as your snack. So if a patient's persistent that they want uh, regular sugar instead of the sweetener and they refuse the sweetener and they will only take the sugar, then just make note that that can spike the blood sugars and maybe even charting or documenting that, that they had this many packets of sugar for the nurse practitioner, the physician. So when they're looking at the blood sugars, they can understand why. Okay, so this is, so I can write this down. Mm -hmm. So que question for um, snack time, for both male and female, ideally is 15 grams, and then I have you guys up to 24, but 15 is the ideal perfect snack. Um, and if they're at 20 grams of carbs, that's all right, because most of those are prepackaged at that amount. So that, that's a good amount of carbs for a snack. For meal time, females tend to be around 45 grams of carbs per meal. There's a range, and dietitians do the calculation based on you know weight, size, um, other needs going on. And then a male usually gets about 60 grams of carbs so, per meal. Does that kind of answer that? Guidelines. Yeah. Or text. Yeah, and I, I think once you think about what the meal time carbs is, that kind of makes you think about the snack. You know, if the snack's going higher than the meal, then you're getting quite a bit of carbs. <laughs> yeah. And if you guys ever have questions with how many grams of carbs are in something, you can always call the dietitian, the diet office. We'll help you guys out. Um, I think just having the ease of mind for your techs with those second low carb snacks and giving it to them and not having to worry, I think will help out a lot. So, any other questions with snacks or carbohydrates? Okay, well then I'm gonna give it back to Amy. All right, so we're gonna kind of move on to hypoglycemia. I will move through this very, fairly quickly. I think we've discussed it before. Um, I, there's a couple of things that I will point out that's very specific, and then we do wanna make sure we get to the case scenario. Um, so I think that will help kind of wrap your mind around everything we need to do. Um, so hypoglycemia is a lower glucose than normal that exposes the patient to potential harm. The Diabetes Association, the American Association of Endocrinology, recommend what we call defensive action at 70. The actual clinical diagnosis of hypoglycemia, it's kind of hard to define, um, but I just heard that the ADA came out with 54 or less as the official hypoglycemia. Now, we say defensive action because we want to prevent them from getting to the point of not being able to think clear and making sure that they're going to be as safe as possible. So they might feel weak, shaky, sweaty, confused, grumpy, same or similar symptoms as a high. The only way to differentiate is to do that point and care sugar. 
Um, so in the hospital, we want to make sure that we're testing and treating for any glucose that's less than 70. If they experience that, we're going to check the glucose every 15 minutes and retreat with a fast-acting carb. Those are the, some of the things that Jackie listed. Juice, regular soda, jello, sugar packets. Those are going to work fast to get that blood sugar up. Um, once it's over 70, we're going to repeat the point of care sugar every 30 minutes until we get three consecutive readings over 70. If during that time frame they drop back down under 70, we start the every 15 minutes over again. Um, and you want to make sure once they're over 70, they have a real snack or a meal within one hour because we want to prevent that rebound hypoglycemia. The rule of 15 says that your blood glucose can raise 15 points in 15 minutes from 15 grams of carbohydrate. That's a general rule. Not everybody follows or plays by the same, but you can kind of expect if that blood sugar was 54, we're going to go 15. That's going to get us pretty close to 70, okay? Um, but we don't want to give them juice plus crackers plus peanut butter on the cracker and put some sugar in the juice because then you were already talking 60 to 75 grams of carb. The patient feels terrible. We understand that they feel terrible, but we don't want to go from that 54 to 250. We want to go up slow, low and slow treatment. Those 15 grams of carb every 15 minutes should raise your sugar about 15 points. If you have a patient who is less than 40, our hypoglycemia protocol says that you can give them two choices, knowing that you're going to need both of those to get to that point of 70, which is the low end of normal goal. Does that make sense? I think a lot of people don't understand that, but you really don't want to jump into treat over treatment. So treatment options, if the patient is conscious and can swallow safely, so we're not, we don't want them to be at any risk for choking or aspirating, you want to start with liquid. It's going to be absorbed faster. It's going to work quicker. Apple juice, white soda, uh, sugar packets, or half a cup of regular Jello. If they are unconscious or their swallowing is impaired, you want to give them something in the IV. I realize that a lot or all of your patients really don't have IVs. If you can get one started, dextrose, D50. If you can't, then you want to go with the glucagon, IM, or sub-Q injection. So those are your options. You do want to shoot for the IV. The risk of glucagon is it can make them nauseous. And so if you're, they're not thinking clear, they're passed out, and they wake up, the next thing you're going to expect is they start throwing up. So it's going to raise their sugar, but you just want to be aware there's a risk that they could start vomiting and aspirate. Um, so you, you just want to use it, be very, very respective of that glucagon. Um, but if you need it, you need it. You can't get an IV, you need to use it. Right. If your patient is to the point of altered level of consciousness, because a lot of your nurses aren't, that's exactly where I was going, you would call a rapid response to get just a more seasoned nurse in that IV access at the bedside as fast as possible. You want somebody in there that can help you. But if you have altered level of consciousness and you can't figure it out within a couple of minutes, you should be calling for help. Um, again, that rule of 15. So hypoglycemia event management. If you have a hypoglycemia event, you wanna make sure you document it on the flow sheet. Documentation in the notes is okay. We recommend the flow sheet because it's easier to be tracked. Um, you can also, I can document on the flow sheet, Jackie and Lisa can all document on the flow sheet. If I make a note and I need to go back in 30 minutes or 60 minutes, but it's the end of my shift, I would have to share my note with you and then you would come in and document on the same note rather than follow up. So the event management flow sheet is better. It does give you choices, that the, all the things that we listed, apple juice, regular soda, all the normal choices that you would have. And then it also has you come in and do that 15, 30, 60, and 90 minute blood sugar. It's places to document. It does not ask you to give the actual result. The only thing it wants to know is if it's greater than or less than 70. Okay, so you don't have to document it was 54. It was less than 70, just pick that one. And then it's gonna tell you the next step. Repeat the blood sugar in 15 minutes. So it's a really nice tool it will help you walk through the hypoglycemia process, but then have the documentation. 
The other piece is, is once you use the uh, flow sheet, it will show on the glucose accordion. So it's easier to see what was done and how the patient responded to that. So notifying your doctor, point of care glucosis for hypoglycemia, less than 70 on two consecutive readings. You should notify your provider. Let them know twice in a row it was less than 70. Any single glucose less than 40, you want to notify them right away. Again, 2 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning, you should notify your provider if it's less than 40. It's a very unsafe situation. Um, the point of care glucose less than 60, that's the critical result level. Now, there's some controversy right now about whether or not we should be repeating that test less than 70 or less than 60. The policy from the lab says you repeat the test immediately less than 60. Nursing protocol says you treat less than 70. So we're trying to lean toward if it's under 70, go ahead and repeat the test just to confirm it is less than 70. So you don't have to remember, well, was it 60 or was it 70? Under 70, repeat the test, then treat the patient if they're still under 70. Uh, use the hypoglycemia protocol. If your physician or provider has used the order set, then all of the rescue for hypoglycemia will be already on your chart. If they have not, then we add a smart phrase for the hypoglycemia protocol. So you have to have that added into your chart to give you the right to treat your patient. Um, so one thing we can't talk hypoglycemia about with is discussing what's called hypoglycemia unawareness. And if you think about the verbiage, it's your patient is unaware that they're low. They don't have the signs and symptoms for them to have that response of, I need to eat right away, I'm weak, I'm shaky, I'm nervous. Um, it is very, very dangerous. Uh, the scenario that we're gonna talk about, the patient had no warning signs of a low and his blood sugar was 23. Uh, it could be a recent or from a recent history of frequent or severe lows, rapid decline if your sugar's dropping fast, alcohol abuse, uh, beta blockers, they can actually suppress your feeling of that low blood sugar, the longer the duration of diabetes. Um, but in the situation we're going to talk about, it was significant stress and depression. Um, and it occurred on you guys' unit, and he ended up going to the TCU. Um, so here's our patient scenario. Patient's blood sugar, um, 232, so reasonable high number, hyperglycemia. We ended up giving him, so in the morning, the whole scenario was in the morning, he had a low blood sugar, about in the 40s. It wasn't enough where we, less than 40, so we had to know the provider right away. The nurse ended up giving the insulin a couple of hours late, just being a healthy fear of that low. So we gave the insulin late, we gave the fast acting insulin late, lunch came, we stacked insulin, we gave eight units, which doesn't seem to be a reasonably high dose for 232 blood sugar, but he had gotten another dose about three hours before. So his insulin stacked up, and when you see he didn't eat lunch, I'm sorry, dinner, he didn't eat dinner, we gave the extra insulin, insulin stacked, and he ended up with the blood sugar. I think the final result was 23. Now he didn't have any warning that that blood sugar was that low because he was very, very depressed, sleeping all the time, slept through supper because he didn't want to get up to eat. Um, we still ended up giving his insulin and he got a blood sugar of 23. So he is one where we ended up having to give glucagon because he couldn't get an IV. They called a rapid access a rapid response. And by the time they treated him, gave him the glucagon, he woke up, we overreacted. We gave him a ton of carbohydrates. I don't, I wanna say it was over 90 grams total. And by three o'clock in the morning, he was 445. So it was, a, you know, we were fearful of the low. It scared everybody, you know, we were very worried that he was so low. We did everything trying to get him up and trying to get him up. We didn't give him any insulin at bedtime. He um, um, acts like a type one. He's not an official type one, but he acts like a type one with diabetes. And so we didn't give his insulin at bedtime because he was low and by the morning he was 430. So those are the exact situations that we wanna have to prevent 
happening. Stacked insulin led to a low, we held insulin led to a high. So you can kind of just follow that and through the entire process. And we didn't do the 15 and 15. Um, I would, ha I think they tried to, but it was like a rapid response. We're doing everything in our bucket to get them up. Uh, so, and I put the square around. If you had a hypoglycemia, you can see where if you documented on the event management, it ends up on the glucose accordion. So really our main goals are prevention. Prevent the high, prevent the low. Um, hyperglycemia, you wanna monitor their snack options, check their blood glucose on time, give the insulin as it's ordered, don't hold it without an order from the physician. Um, if they have a history of diabetes, test the blood sugar, and let the doctor know. One of the scenarios that kind of helped us get here today was you had a patient admitted from the ER, A1C was high, blood sugar was high. Um, in the ER, they treated it, got the blood sugar down, but once they got to the unit, we didn't test them again for another 10 hours or so, 10 to 12 hours. And so by the time we were testing them, their blood sugar was well over, I wanna say 400. So it went way high, whereas had we tested on behavioral health, we would have known it was high and maybe called the provider for orders. It was a late admission, it happened kind of over the night. Uh, and if you're concerned, call. I've talked to, like I said, I've talked to Diana and Susan both and they'd rather you call than not. Sometimes you get the response of, I don't wanna do that, don't worry about it, um, but that needs to be their decision, not ours well, as nurses. and they have to call them, mm -hmm. right. So on the night shift, you're exactly right, they might not get one of the nurse practitioners that know your patient population, um, but they still have to call a provider because it's not our scope of practice as nurses not to follow protocol. So we wanna make sure to follow what we have available. On the low side, give the fast acting insulin with the food, make sure it's as absolutely close as possible. Check blood glucose for any signs of hypoglycemia um, and it can be they're just more confused than usual. If they've had insulin, it's okay to go ahead and test because you don't know, are they more confused from medications, their condition, or is it a low blood sugar? Um, check it on time. Monitor their PO intake, like the scenario we just had. He slept through dinner. It's, you know, it is still his right, but we need to encourage him. We need to give you insulin. Let's make sure you have some carbohydrates at the same time. Um, utilize the order sets, that's a provider uh, decision. If you find that you don't have the order set, you can always ask. I see they're getting this insulin, can we use the order set so that you have those hypoglycemia rescue, all the orders to help protect the nurse. Um, and then again, if concerned, call. All right, that's a duplicate slide. All right, so here's our case scenario. Um, this is for you guys, so I want you to talk loud. I'm gonna try to repeat what you say, um, but we're almost done, I promise. So CJ is a 36-year-old female alcoholic admitted to behavioral health for depression with type two diabetes. Now, this is a pet peeve of mine, but you notice I didn't say she was a 36-year-old diabetic, right? She's a person first who happens to have diabetes, who happens to have depression, who happens to have alcohol. She's an alcoholic. So I try hard not to say they're diabetic because that's putting a label on them. If I say they're a person who happens to have diabetes, we have to treat the condition. Right? I feel sometimes we pinpoint people with diabetes a lot. So our point of care glucose uh, lunch was 56 and she says, don't worry, I do this all the time. Just give me a Snickers and I'll be fine. You ever heard that? Maybe not a Snickers, but something else. Her home medication, Lantus 30, once a day at bedtime, Novolog 15, three times a day, um, and her A1C is 6.1. So what about that 56? If that happened on your unit, what would you guys do? Reject and repeat first, number one, good. It's 58. Now what? We're gonna keep the 58, that's right. <laughs> it looks better on paper than a 56. 
Yep. And we're going to keep repeating for 15 minutes until we get up to greater than 70. Yep. And then we're going to check after that 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We're going to check in another 30 minutes. And we're going to do a total of, of 90 minutes. Yep, three consecutive readings. So what Terry said was you're going to reject the first result. We'll say it came back 58. Uh, we're going to keep the second result. We're going to treat the patient 15 grams of carbohydrate, retest in 15 minutes, every 15 minutes until they're over 70, and then retest every 30 minutes for three consecutive readings over 70. So, good job. We have to make sure that the provider has been contacted. And notify the physician, the provider, yes. So, the 56, 58, if she's awake, alert, you know, doing okay. If you know that the provider's coming in within an hour, you can let them know when they show up. If she had altered level of consciousness or symptoms or less than 40, you would get on the phone right away. Okay, so you kind of have to think, you know, 56 is we need to pay attention to, but we have a little bit of leeway on, now do I want you to wait three or four hours? No, but if you know, they're, you know the time frame, they're gonna be on your unit let them know when they stop by. So, all right, um, and then CJ says, don't worry, I do this all the time. What do you think about that? She needs some education, education. yep. Yeah. Um, I try to tell the patient that just because you do it doesn't make it right. It's not safe. Um, if she wasn't feeling bad, I would be concerned that she had that hypoglycemia unawareness. We want to tell them that's not safe. I use the word safe all the time because you don't want to say it's not right, I, although I do once in a while, um, but that's really not a safe plan, okay? Um, so this I just want to bring up real quick. The Novolog 15 units three times a day, we don't all eat the same amount of food or carbohydrates at every single meal. So when you see a large dose of insulin like that, um, typically, it's, too, it's going to be too high for them. So she's eating, she's taking her insulin, maybe she's doing a great job because her A1C is 6. However, she goes low all the time because that dose is probably on the high side. Um, so insulin is dosed based on weight. So you know, unless she is, I want to be kind here, 100 kilos, that's going to be way too high. Um, so we want to maybe consider, is that 15 reasonable? The other thing is, while they're in the hospital, we control their calories. So maybe she was eating a 2,000 calorie diet at home, 2,200, 2,500, and now we put them on 18. Well, if that 15 was sufficient, it obviously wasn't, but if it was sufficient, now we've cut back on their calories by, you know, three, four, 500 a meal or a day. That's gonna increase their risk for low also. So it doesn't make sense, is it reasonable? In this situation, it's not. A1C is 6.1. 120, give or take. Remember, the A1C doesn't always show the whole picture. So in her situation, if she was in the 50s, I gotta do the fast math in my head, she could be having blood sugars of 180 and 200 in the same day, and that A1C still look reasonable, okay? So if you see a lower than normal A1C with pretty large insulin doses, you can guarantee they're having low blood sugars at home. Um, and so then you start having that conversation. Well, how often does it really happen? And then just let the nurse practitioner or provider know. Um, so it's important to, we see A1C is 6.1 and you're like, you rock. Well, let's get the whole story before we call anybody. Um, all right, she says, give me a Snickers bar. Right. So she's getting the correct food here. So we know she's not getting the correct food at all. Right. So. Yeah. 
So, right, so what you're telling me is that a lot of times they do have significantly larger intake when they're at home. Yes. And their insulin is based on their home plan. And then we bring them here. So depending on where you work, um, are, it's reasonable to decrease their insulin when they're admitted, especially when they're on significant amounts of insulin by at least 20%. I don't know that we do that often, but then also having the conversation with the patient that this is good healthy eating for everybody. We should all be on the same meal plan. Um, if they're still complaining, because that's what they're used to having at home, um, then I would say contact the dietitian. They're, they can help them work around getting maybe a little extra food and additional protein portion without giving them extra carbohydrates that won't affect their blood sugar as much. What I'm finding too is they may not even be on insulin at home, but when we get on air, they put them on insulin. They yes. They put them on correction insulin at mealtime, and the patient's like, I don't take insulin. So we're starting them on a new medication that they're not always discharging. So when they come in and they were not maybe on insulin at home, it's just a conversation to have. And I just explain it, any kind of illness, any kind of stress, and most of the time they're all doing this because of the stress problem, any kind of infection, um, not sleeping in your own bed, being woke up multiple times a day, maybe their medication they're adjusting. And the nurse practitioners realize that they have a higher chance of developing diabetes become the psychiatric disorders that they have then they want we want to go ahead and test the blood sugar and look for they're not just looking for diabetes but just impaired glucose tolerance and so that is a precursor to developing diabetes down the road um, and it's if they didn't do that the providers it, it wouldn't be the right thing to do for the patient so we have a conversation then um, you're here because of these things, illness, stress, infection, your eating is different. The insulin is for treatment of the high if you develop it when you're here. When you go home, you probably won't be on it. And then you can base that on their A1C and their trending of glucose, which is why that accordion is very important. Um, so it's just a conversation and help them educate. You can call me. You can try to hear it from, because if they're hearing it from people they see every day, when they're on the unit, it may mean something different if like I come in or Jackie comes in and says, okay, I hear this is what you're struggling with. Let us help you understand why. And sometimes having just somebody else different say it. So that might be just something that maybe we should do when a patient's coming in that's not only insulin at home and we're putting them on it to maybe consult you to come in and talk to them? Sure. Yeah, you can certainly consult if they have questions, if they have concerns. Now, you guys as nurses can't explain to them what I just said. That didn't take a certification behind your name because you understand that the medicines, the Zyprexa, the Haldol, the Clonopin, the Seroquel, I mean, I could probably list 15 different ones that's going to increase their um, glucose metabolism, make those changes. So we need that while you're here and we're tweaking your meds. If they still don't get it, absolutely. Our consults are nurse driven. You don't need a provider permission for us to come in and see the patient. Um, and that's just kind of standard everywhere. So. Awesome questions. All right, I think we're done. Any more questions, complaints, concerns? No? Nope. All right, you guys. I've got a lot of questions. Uh, when you were talking about the 72 consecutive readings, I know when we're doing that's high quality, just one episode. Mm -hmm. Let's say at lunchtime, that was at breakfast. At lunch, they were low again. Is that, the two, is that considered another two consecutive readings, like how they have over 250 two consecutive times we call the doctor? It's any two lows in a row. So if it's at lunch, breakfast, and lunch, mm -hmm. they need to be notified that they are dropping at least no times. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. So two consecutive readings, um, and it could be they were 56 on the reject, they were 58, that's one. Yeah. And then they come up to 65, that's technically two. Because there are two consecutive readings, it's not two consecutive events. So two consecutive readings, less than 70, is when you wanna notify the physician. 
And when I talked with Susan yesterday, I, um, I don't say warned her because that's like a bad word, but I said, now these nurses are going to be awesome and all over diabetes and they might be calling you a little more often. So they're going to hopefully be waiting for it. So, um, well, I appreciate you guys letting me come and talk and hopefully um, we'll get a better handle on it. I know that um, Tracy and Megan have, are both your diabetes nurse champions on behavioral health. We do have, in addition to this, a four hour class once a month on just general diabetes and inpatient glycemic control, not specific to behavioral health. And then the nurse champion program that they went through um, is beginning next week, but it's 12 hours of diabetes education. So if you're interested, um, cause Megan and Tracy are awesome, but we don't have anybody on day shift. So, okay, all right, you'll be the day shift. I'm all over it. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you.